So Coleridge subtitled Kublai Khan, first written in 1797, published around 18, in 1816. He subtitled Kublai Khan the following, um, Kublai Khan, the title, or A Vision in a Dream, a Fragment. Now this is a very odd subtitle. First of all, just think about a vision. What is a vision? Normally we associate a vision with some sort of supernatural sight. If I, if I came to you and said, I've had a vision, you would, you would think, oh, well, he's seen something invisible or he's grasped some kind of reality that is beyond what most of us can grasp. And this vision was, was unique, extraordinary, and he will report it to us. He, he might be some kind of prophet or inspired poet. Okay, great. Kublai Khan, a vision. But then a vision in a dream, what does this suggest? If it's a vision in a dream, then can we take it seriously as a vision? A, a dream puts the vision in a realm of, of, of fantasy, reverie, lack of reality, interiority. So, so now there's a sense that, that, that if the poem is a vision in a dream, we ask, well, how seriously can we take it? It's, it's just a wisp. It's, it's, it's subjective. You know how dull it is to hear about people's dreams, and if I tell you about a vision and a dream, you can't take it seriously as a vision. All right. But then, yet a third um, descriptor, a fragment. Well, what, what, what does this do of our, to our sense of the poem? Why would we want to read a poem that's not even finished? It's, a, it's, not, it's, it's, it's incomplete. Why even publish it? It's a fragment. So Coleridge seems to be trying to un lower the expectations of readers radically in this poem suggesting that, well, you know, don't even take the poem that seriously. And of course, that is a way to protect him against criticism. If someone doesn't like the poem, he himself can say, well, why would you? It's only a vision in a dream. It's only a fragment. It's a trifle. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Well, Coleridge obviously was much more ambitious than this. And the way to get at um, this subtitle from another angle uh, is to think about the poem as a fragment not merely as a poem that's incomplete, not ready for publication, but as a poem that, that participates in this tradition that began in the late 1790s in Germany that suggests that fragments, strangely enough, are more likely to conjure in us a vision of grandeur and completeness than a more completed, polished poem might. So Friedrich and August Schlegel um, and their colleague um, Frederick von Hardenberg, otherwise known as Novalis, in 1798 published um, in Germany a collection called the, the Athenaeum Fragments. And in this collection, they suggested that the fragment is the most appropriate vehicle for romantic literature. Now, let's just think about that. If I took um, you and several other people out on a field trip, uh, we're in Greece and we go to out into the country and we see this old temple ruin maybe five columns are left maybe two of the columns are only are only half left you've got crumbling rock here crumbling rock there and i said to you all right look at this ancient ruin this fragment of what was once a full structure um, i want you to imagine th this this fragment as complete i want you to draw or write about how this would look if it were complete well, of course, because you don't know how it looked when it was completed, uh, you can draw, you can write endlessly. In other words, the fragment generates endless interpretation. It generates endless visions of ungraspable holes, um, completenesses. So in this regard, the radical finitude of the fragment generates infinite um, imagined interpretations. So this is one way to think about the, the power of what is incomplete. Um, it pushes you toward endless acts of interpretation and imagining. Whereas a more completed poem, you get to the end of it, and often it sort of forecloses uh, the generation of infinite meaning, or even a lot of, a lot of meaning. So I think one way to think about the, the fragment in this regard in Coleridge's poem Kublai Khan is in this way, that it's a fragment, but a fragment in service of a vision of the sublime. The sublime being, of course, an experience um, not of harmony or symmetry, which you might get at the end of a completed poem, but the sublime an experience of the boundless, the, cha the chaotic, the immeasurable. And when you get to the end of an incomplete poem like 
Kublai Khan, incomplete insofar as it doesn't bring with the more traditional conventions of a poem that, that signposts for readers uh, various meanings that the poet wants to get across. Kublai Khan doesn't have those signposts. It doesn't suggest meanings um, as clearly as more traditional poems might. So we get to the end of this poem and we, we feel like, okay, I don't quite know what it means, but this isn't a reason to despair so much as it's an opportunity, an invitation uh, to interpret the poem um, vigorously, imaginatively, and in a real way, endlessly.